I'm Hans Hoffmann. I'm a professor in integrative biology at UT Austin. And uh, there I'm also the director of the Center for Computational Biology and Bioinformatics. And every summer I come to the MBL to uh, direct one of the large summer courses here, the course in Neural Systems and Behavior. And um, yeah, I've been doing this now in my third year. The first summer I spent here was in 2000 uh, as a grass fellow. I think I've visited um, once or twice before, maybe for a retreat or just for a short visit, but that was the first extended stay here where I actually did research. I had a very clear project planned out uh, to work on these African cichlid fishes that would be kept in the MRC. And I expected several shipments of these fish and um, the carrier managed to kill all of them except for one package or not deliver them in time and they had died. And so I was left with only about 20 animals. And uh, I couldn't really pursue my original project. And so in the grass laboratory, uh, you know, it's a very collaborative spirit. It's a, um, you are in a relatively small space. Uh, there are 10 or 12 uh, junior scientists, usually postdocs, who work very hard on very different questions and they help each other out. And uh, that's exactly what happened there, that uh, I quickly found another set of questions that I had been interested in and found a way working with other fellows, um, particularly Melina Hale, who is now at the University of Chicago, and she was a grass fellow at the same time, uh, to work on a new project. And, uh, and the other thing that really helped me was that I made contacts with the neurobiology course and uh, was able to get a lot of time um, almost exclusive use for a large chunk of the summer on an electrophysiology setup they had there where I could uh, do experiments on my animals uh, that while they were not using the equipment. So even that first time I was here I already took, took advantage of what I guess you could call the MBL spirit of um, you know, collaboration and, and close interaction that just, you just have this attitude that you can get it done somehow. That is a really good question since there is not this one you know, eureka moment or uh, this one thing that I was really interested in. Growing up, I grew up on a small farm. I was surrounded by animals and I had an interest in, you know, nature and natural history, but not particularly well-developed, maybe. I had a lot of other interests as well. And um, I think one of the reasons why I chose to go into biology was really because it seemed to not only be very interesting, but also be a lot more open-ended, uh, have a lot more opportunities for asking questions compared to maybe some of the other sciences. At least that was my impression at the time. And I think that certainly turned out to be the case. Yeah, there are a couple of people. So I did my first couple of years of university studies at the University of Würzburg. And initially was very interested in genetic engineering biotechnology, which is starting to take off at the time, and quickly realized that it was intellectually not very appealing to me uh, because it's really more engineering, like building things and not so much understanding how things work. And, um, and then I was a little lost and I kept going to the zoological symposium every week. And there was this one speaker who had this amazing uh, story about uh, acoustic communication in crickets, of all things, uh, how the male produces sounds and how they attract the female, how the female can actually uh, detect the direction and uh, you know, the quality of the sound and so on and, and make appropriate behavioral decisions. And that speaker was uh, Franz Huber, uh, who 
inspired me to really look into neuroscience and, and animal behavior, the neural mechanisms of behavior. And I got very interested in that, started reading more about it. And, that, and then I stumbled upon another individual, uh, Valentino Breitenberg, and tubing in at the time at the Max Planck Institute. So all my training was in Germany. And um, he had developed a number of uh, kind of uh, purely speculative, if you will, scenarios about how the brain works and how certain kinds of computations come about, uh, but in a very compelling way, also proposing ways to test them. And I found that appealing from an intellectual point of view. So one day I would just drive from U University of Würzburg down to Tübingen and unannounced walk into his office and say, you know, this is me and I'm really interested in what you do. And he gave me some very good advice. And so I actually moved to that university then and got my master's there. And after, in the meantime, I also got in touch with Franz Huber and ended up doing my PhD thesis with him. So those were the two individuals that probably influenced me the most in becoming you know, a behavioral neuroscientist or a neuroethologist. So the, the way I think now is really two questions within one larger framework. And the first question gets at uh, the neural basis and molecular basis of social behavior in particular. That's what I'm mostly interested in. So including sexual behavior, aggressive behavior, and parental care behavior, if you want to limit it to that. And, uh, but there are other ways of looking at social behavior and understand you know, how does the brain actually generate this behavior? How do animals, given a certain social environment, uh, evaluate the saliency of a stimulus? How do they make decisions to behave in a certain way that ideally should be adaptive, meaning it should allow them to produce offspring? Um, but not only to do that in one model system, uh, which is fine and uh, important, but to see how these mechanisms themselves has, have actually evolved across a whole range of species. And in our case, we decided to be fairly um, ambitious and to ask how that has happened in vertebrates. And so we've made some headway in that regard and have found that there is, in fact, um, if you will, a, a circuitry in the brain that we call the social decision-making network that consists of a bunch of brain nuclei and cell populations that are important in regulating social behavior that apparently already was present in the last common ancestor of fishes and humans about 450, 500 million years ago. And that there's this common theme of behavioral regulation or the mechanisms of behavioral regulation across vertebrates. Um, and then that much of the diversity that we see in the natural world uh, maybe can be explained by relatively small variations on that theme that we're beginning to explore. And <clears throat> the, the other big question that we're slowly getting into, mostly in, with collaborations, um, then ask a slightly different question. And there we're asking how variation in these mechanisms, but now not across species, but within a species, you know, across males of a given species, for example, that may pursue different kinds of reproductive tactics, how this kind of variation uh, is reflected by variation in the underlying mechanisms, and how this variation then is also reflected or gives rise to variation in reproductive outcomes and ultimately fitness. Because the currency, the only currency that natural selection cares about is you know, how many genes, simply put, you can pa pass into the next generation. And, um, and so that linking studies of fitness consequences um, in terms of behavioral variation in the field to studies on the neuromolecular basis of behavior, variations in those kinds of mechanisms is a terra incognita at this point, you know, not much has been done because it's been very difficult, but we have discovered a couple of model systems where we can do that. And now both these kinds of approaches or questions are situated within this larger framework that we call the comparative approach. And that really goes back to Aristotle, you know, 2300 years ago, who pretty much had figured out a lot of what we're still doing 
already, um, who very much advocated to not just look at one animal or one species in isolation and try to understand it, but said that by comparing across close related and more distant related species, uh, we can actually learn a lot about you know, the features and how they come about and understand some of the underlying principles and mechanisms of behavior or nervous system or brain function uh, by comparison. And we can now do this much better because we have phylogenetic methods that allow us to first infer the evolutionary relationships between different species in a reasonable way and then take into account those relationships when we do the comparisons. Uh, and so these research programs both are situated within that approach. For the past three years, I've been director of our Center for Computational Biology and Bioinformatics, and there we've done a number of things to enhance, if you will, quantitative biology at UT Austin. And uh, one thing is that we've developed a lot of training programs, particularly targeting graduate students, postdocs, and also faculty, where they can learn modern bioinformatics approaches um, and you know, in a broadly defined in a way that is just in time, with which I mean that when they have a problem, when they have the data, they can come to us and they can learn this. So we do this in a number of different ways. Uh, we have a few semester-long traditional classes, but not many, um, such as you know, programming Python for biologists, that kind of thing. But what we mostly do is, is that we organize a series of short courses that introduce people to particular bioinformatics approaches and analysis uh, pipelines, um, to you know, scripting in, in uh, Unix, for example, um, and Unix command line, those kinds of things. And those are only three hours long, and they are not meant to impart any kind of in-depth skill or understanding but to get people over this activation threshold and over this fear threshold that a lot of biologists have when they see numbers and when they see programming and big high-performance compute systems. And once they realize I can do this, which almost all of them do, then uh, they can take more in-depth courses. We have a summer school every May where we um, now I think we've had more like 250, almost 300 students that we've served, I think, from more than 30 cities in the U.S., so it goes beyond UT Austin. The other thing that we do is that I've built a, a team of consultants. So these are staff scientists that work with researchers at UT and beyond um, on particular problems in the context of genomics, bioinformatics, proteomics. And we have different tiers of support that we offer. Um, and and so that has become a, a really important resource, especially for those labs that are just getting into it or they don't have the expertise themselves. The final thing that we have is a collaboratorium where graduate students, postdocs, and even faculty can uh, come together. There are seven desks with large monitors. There are, um, are tables where they can, and conference rooms. You know, there are uh, different kinds of social areas where they can mingle and work either by themselves or together on a project or so and, and also get to know each other and the offices of our consultants are right there so they can talk to them as well. And that is also still a work in progress um, but clearly an, an, a, an approach that seems to work for some people very well. And so to which extent that now relates to what I'm doing here in the summer with the Neural Systems and Behavior course, at first glance it seems like these are two very different things. But as it turns out, one of the <clears throat> goals we've had with the course was to really uh, become more integrative in the sense that um, we have you know, individual model systems that students learn about, but historically they've been fairly isolated from each other. And they usually only explore a particular question at one level of biological organization. So they may only do electrophysiology or imaging, for example. And, uh, and so we've set out to add 
uh, other levels of analysis to it. Uh, these could be you know, different on a temporal or spatial scale, but it could be across levels. We've added a lot of molecular and cell biology to it integrating with some of the existing modules um, and I think longer term uh, what I would like to do is to actually add this genomics component to it and um, you know, bring in a, a bioinformatics training aspect as well. And that is not entirely trivial but I think that students in this day and age really need to have some sort of a working knowledge of these approaches so they can make educated decisions about the kinds of methods that they need to answer the questions they're interested in. Something behavior courses are very unique, probably a singular course uh, in the world that really trains the next generation of systems neuroscientists and neuroethologists, so people who at a systems and organismal level are interested in the neural basis of behavior. And, um, and we do that uh, apparently quite successfully because many of the students who've taken the course have gone on to be very successful. And the course as a consequence has an has iconic status. You know, the people who go through it, they learn a lot, but not only that, they also form these lifelong you know, professional networks and, and friendships that really are with them until they retire. In the course, in its current organizational form, if you will, was really developed in 1978 by Ellen Gelperin, uh, who's now at Princeton. And uh, a lot of changes have occurred over the years, uh, you know, depending on who was course director and faculty, um, but it still has this basic idea of looking at the neural basis of behavior and using electrophysiology and now also imaging computational approaches and now also molecular and cell approaches. And, um, and so that has obviously been a very successful model and students really want to take this course uh, not only because they learn a lot of skills, you know, skills you can learn in all kinds of places. But our course is a research discovery course where people initially go through kinds of exercises and they learn certain kinds of technical skills and, and techniques, but then they develop their own research projects and they work on their own research project. Uh, and quite often these research projects lead to um, you know, larger projects in the faculty's laboratories, sometimes in collaboration with the students. Uh, a lot of the data that has been collected at, uh, at MBL uh, has you know, um, supported grant application or has even ended up in publications. So it is really, uh, I think what we really achieve there is that we allow students to become scientists and, and, and think in terms of questions uh, that are interested and interesting and important to them. This may be unusual and that uh, Andre Fenton, my co-director and I have implemented here from day one when we took over the course was that we developed our own collaborative research project. So the course director are provided with laboratory space and that we've you know, cleaned out and made available and use, useful and we developed a collaborative project uh, that builds on a model system that Andre works on in his home lab, uh, but asks questions that are of great interest to me, such as, you know, how much variation is there between different neurons that uh, supposedly are engaged in the same task or in a different task? And uh, we've developed ways of doing that at the single neuron level in the hippocampus of mouse. Uh, in the context of uh, a learning paradigm. And uh, so we've developed these approaches. We have found ways to isolate these single neurons, uh, to extract RNA and to do gene expression profiling on single neurons. And uh, we're not only doing this research here, which is you know, interesting and, and cutting edge, but uh, quite a bit of the things that we've developed in this research uh, has over the last two years 
been then integrated into the course itself, uh, into either existing modules or into a new module that we started up last year that we call an Integrative Molecular and Neurothology module. And, uh, and so we're doing this because Andre and I are, of course, very busy with all kinds of things. Um, both he and I have always brought a trainee with us, a graduate student or a postdoc, as what we call a course developer. That, uh, and, and they basically engage in the research with us uh, they drive it forward, uh, and then they also develop it to the extent where at least certain aspects of it can be uh, incorporated into the course proper. And I think that is has been a very successful model and something that we would like to expand on, um, and, th and we are thinking of different ways of doing that. Yeah, there is one that always comes to mind, and that was um, maybe six or seven years ago. And I was here visiting a friend of mine who at the time was in the grass laboratory. And I end up in NSMB and get introduced to Len Mailer, who was her teaching faculty there at the time. And uh, he is not only a very good electrophysiologist, he's also uh, I don't know, one of the leading comparative neuroanatomist, and he has very, very unusual and unorthodox ideas about the functional role of different forebrain regions and so on in teleost fishes as compared to tetrapods like birds or mammals. And, um, and so I got to talk to him about this and some of the problems we were trying to answer at the time and uh, what struck me was his insistence on me to not only you know, interrogate molecularly these systems in terms of gene expression, um, being kind of ignorant uh, about spatial expression patterns, but to actually do this in a neuroanatomical way and become very explicit about spatial expression patterns and neuroanatomy. And so that triggered a whole series of projects and papers where um, we did a lot of neuroanatomy and neurochemistry that culminated in this large body of work where we reconstructed the evolution of this forebrain and midbrain circuitry that I referred to earlier, the social decision-making network. So I think that conversation or a series of conversations I had with Len Mela at the time was certainly an important impetus for that. The, the big benefit of the course being here at MBL is that we are embedded in a very vibrant community of an intellectually very challenging community of neuroscientists, but also of cell biologists, of developmental biologists, and so on. And for the students, it can be quite rewarding to go around and meet all kinds of very well-known or famous uh, colleagues for the first time, establish a personal relationship, either with the resident researchers or with the summer researchers like the Whitman Fellows, the Grass Fellows, of course. And, um, and for the faculty, you know, you may wonder why the faculty would spend two weeks of their lives working very intensely from nine in the morning till after midnight, six days a week, with the students in ways they don't actually have time to do in their own home laboratory. And, um, well, that's one of the reasons, because here they can do real research. They can, you know, stand at the bench or sit at the, at the electrophysiology rig and do what they really get to do at home. What we've also seen is, is that quite often faculty will start collaborating with each other and they have an idea and they try it out and you know they play around and it's not unusual that you walk into the lab at two o'clock in the morning and three or four faculty are sitting together trying to figure something out, something that never happens at the home institutions. And it's also a really good recruiting ground. If you're looking for a future postdoc or if you your department might be hiring in the area and you're looking for talented young people who might become colleagues, then this is a really good place to find them and get to know them. 
Um, so, so there are all kinds of reasons why um, people come to this course and why the community has embraced it so much and is invested in it and why uh, it really benefits from being at the MBL and not somewhere else. I think if we would try to recreate this course anywhere else, it wouldn't really work. So.